hit hard by the ramifications of the pandemic. This is an opportunity to celebrate the intersection of Chinatown and queer culture, all while supporting local businesses. It's especially important now more than ever for LGBTQ people to be in solidarity with Chinese American and Asian American communities because resilience and hope have always been central to San Francisco Pride's mission. At Pride, we feel a duty to expand on this effort, using our resources to build goodwill and assist a neighborhood that has felt the economic impacts of COVID-19 harder than most. The fact that hate crimes against the AAPI community are on the rise only strengthens our resolve to express solidarity with the historically marginalized group. With that said, grab a drink, hop into the chat, and let's get into it. My name is Hoi Liao, and I'm the curator at the Chinese Culture Center. We are a 50 plus year old organization based in San Francisco's Chinatown. Our mission is to elevate the underserved and be the voice for equality. All the work that we do are at the intersection of art and community. As a queer API community member, I really truly feel the need for healing a bit all the trauma that has been related to the anti-Asian violence that we see in our community today. I want to encourage everyone to see that API folks are not a monolith. And this is why it's so important for me to put out exhibitions like this uh, to showcase the diversity of all people of color in our communities. My name is Chelsea Wong and I'm a painter and muralist based out of San Francisco. And here I am at my studio in the Mission District. And mostly I do watercolor paintings and some acrylic on canvas paintings, but they kind of express these scenes of joy and I reimagine the space that I see and that we exist in. So one of my big influences is Chinatown and Chinese culture and just where that intersects in my life and the scenes that I observe from daily travel. The first painting I'm going to talk about is called a Secret Place Lipo Lounge. And this painting um, is based on Lipo Lounge in Chinatown. And actually, Lipo Lounge was a safe haven for the gay community in the 1940s. So in the painting, you can kind of see these two women talking. And then there's a little policeman talking, or sorry, he's taking notes. And then there's kind of these um, like military or army dudes and sailors walking around. and the there's a proprietor at the front door and he's kind of just protecting these conversations so it looks like the policeman who's taking notes he might be onto something but he might not be so it's really important for me to portray women in my art i grew up in a household of women i have four Four, or sorry, there's four, me, my three older sisters, and my mother. So growing up, we had six of us. It was just my dad and five women. And so for me, painting women is very important because I feel like there's strength in being a woman and having that power and agency. And it's important for me to portray strong women and diverse women and powerful women. And in a lot of my work, I use a lot of text, um, not in these pieces, but it's important in my text to kind of give people this sense of agency and sense of power and to kind of address the issues that are a little bit more under the surface, such as equality and supporting each other and what that means. In 39 and 40, in the beginning of World War II, we had people willing and able to spend money for the first time after the Depression, enjoying entertainment. It became a liberty port, San Francisco did. We had all armed services here. And they got liberty, and so they went to the nightclubs. 
So it was wonderful for business and for show business particularly. And then when you come to having something unusual like Forbidden City with Chinese entertainment, which they'd never seen. I mean, they came from the Middle West. Who had ever seen? They had they never even seen a Chinese, let alone a Chinese performer. There had not been a Chinese nightclub in America up until that time. I was first to build a Chinese bar in San Francisco, and then uh, I was the first to build a Chinese nightclub, not only in San Francisco, but in all of America. Golden Gate Fujikoki factory started in August 5th, 1962 by my uncle and my mom. And ever since then, we've been making handmade cookies serving world-class uh, tours. And people get amazed at when they look at how Fujikoki are made and taste one of our authentic cookies. My mom, early in the morning, she makes the batter, every fresh batter every morning, and then starts at seven o'clock. And at the same time, the machine needs to be heated up. It takes 45 minutes to heat up. By the time the batter finished making, the machine is ready to go. And then she just pours the batter into the container there and pumps out from the copper tube and goes around. It takes about four and a half minutes to come out. The last year, February, we all laughing at China having the pandemic. Uh, we thought we, we we didn't get affected, you know. So we are also happy on uh, my own business, you know. So, and we are too early to celebrate. And by the end of March, we already the mayor had declared that we had to shut down. So that's the time we hit the world back till now until now. During this pandemic, uh, we're having a tough time. We have a tough time since we are depending on tourism. So we have no tours to come here, and this place is just like dead. No one show up. Even right now, it has no people show up. Because people need to recover. They're scared. And we need to um, maneuver a little bit, and then we need to adjust. You know, since it's just so, so slow, no, no, not, that, not that much uh, foot traffic, we need to maybe close the day off, or shut the machine the day off, and to, to, to manage it, to get through this pandemic. San Francisco is full of different, different cultures, different people, no matter who you are, either you're Mexican or Chinese or black or white. We all work together, we all understand each other, uh, um, try to make a better living here, make San Francisco a beautiful city. Hello, my name is Tina Takamoto, and my film entitled Ever Wanting for Margaret Chung is showing as part of the women from her to here exhibition at the Chinese Culture Center. So my film Ever Wanting for Margaret Chung is an ex a short experimental film dedicated to an extraordinary individual who is named Margaret Chung. She was um, the first American-born Chinese woman surgeon in the United States. She came to San Francisco Chinatown in the 1920s. Um, and I had heard amazing stories about her. Um, she went by Mike when she was in college. She often wore masculine clothing during that era. Um, she when she was in nursing school, she was known to climb into the beds of other nurses. Um, 
and um, and then I'd also heard great stories that she um, had intimate relationships with famous lesbians such as Elsa Gidlow, um, the famous lesbian poet, um, and a long-term relationship with the uh, very popular entertainer Sophie Tucker. So when it comes to thinking about Margaret Chung in terms of a sense of belonging, I think her story is complicated because on the one hand she was really in the center of a lot of um, exciting things, um, but also she probably thought of herself as, as partly on the periphery. Um, when I was reading her memoir, she, um, she once said that she thought her life would have been so much better and easier if she had been born white. Um, and reading that line was both um, heartbreaking um, and, and also very moving. Um, you know, I, I think especially in relation to queerness, she probably felt more able to be out um, in white circles, um, in, in circles of celebrity, um, in terms of, you know, the starlets and opera singers that she always had on her arm. Um, and so in that regard, she was, it was, she was probably known to be queer, um, but also was deliberately closeted, for instance, when she approached writing her memoir. Um, so there's, you know, she talks about her, her decision not to include any of those personal aspects of her life. Bernice was an abstract expressionist painter. When she made her art, she came from a very spiritual Buddhist-centered way of making art. When she showed me her paintings, I heard sound and I saw light. She was fascinated with Jung. She was fascinated with Buddhism and Zen. She was fascinated with existentialism. A flat sheet of canvas could take me into the other world of senses. In high school, she got awards for her art, and that meant a lot to her to be seen. Her grandmother said that she had talent and that she could draw. Bingo had an easel in there. Everybody started hanging out at North Beach. And one of the hangouts where people would go to either drink beer would be a spaghetti factory. And Bernice Bingo, as she was known, she was a waitress there. And uh, she was going to school and she was spending a hell of a lot of time in the studio being a painter. She graduated from the first MFA class from the San Francisco Art Institute, and that was the most amazing class with so many artists with so much talent. Joan Brown, Leo Valador, Elmore Bischoff, and she emerged with a bang. We could surmise from a sort of maybe feminist perspective at this point that there were issues of race, class, and, and a number of other things that impose the glass ceiling that some of us do not find quite as formidable as in her day. I think an obvious struggle was that she knew how good she was as an artist, and it was hard for her not to have this recognized, that she didn't have an official niche in abstraction art history, <laughs> feminist art history lesbian art history. I think that was a challenge to watch art history being made, remade, etc. And there was never a very prominent space for her. The highest form of art is, is like a vehicle. 
you know, it becomes like a mantra. She deposited within us reasons to be alive and reasons to care and reasons to love. Bernice changed the world. She really changed the world in her really quiet kind of way and sometimes not so quiet kind of way. Because the generations that come after that can only benefit by seeing what inspiring contributions were made, how they contributed to our cultural landscape. And I think that's really important in terms of letting people know what things are possible, sort of redefining the cultural canons. I think that she is a hero for Asian women in particular and women artists in general. The more stories that we gather like hers, the more we benefit by being able to enrich the world with their contributions in spite of their own hardships. My name is Lenore Chin, and we're standing in front of the old spaghetti factory at 478 Green Street. This was the location of Bernice Bing's working studio upstairs in the back. You can't really tell now because the building is, has changed quite a bit um, since the late 50s, early 60s, when she was going to the California School of Fine Arts, which uh, later became the Art Institute. And she also worked as a cocktail waitress downstairs. So it was quite the venue and hub for people who uh, were part of that literary and artistic genre. This place, uh, the cellar, is another place that Bernie Spink worked as a cocktail waitress. She was born in 1936. She was born in Chinatown. When she was still a student, um, I think she started to gain some recognition for her, her work. Uh, a lot of them were large oils on canvas. Um, but eventually, because it was just too difficult to try to concentrate on her work, she moved up to the Mendocino area. Uh, eventually, uh, she became quite ill. So in 1998, um, she passed away from lupus and other medical complications and she was only about 63. So it, it's taken a, about 22 years or so of a core group of us who have keep trying to put her out there, her name, her contributions, and get her into shows here and there, get her into books. So it's like all of a sudden, you know, things seem to be aligning. We're happy that the Chinese Culture Center is part of this support network. My name is Brandon Ju. I am the chef and owner of Mr. Ju's here in San Francisco Chinatown. We're located on 28 Waverly Place and we serve Chinese American food. We opened in 2016. It's been quite a ride. We got our Michelin star the first year and kind of took off from there. We are in a building that is historic to Chinatown. It's been a restaurant here since the late 1800s. So I, I felt like there was a lot of legacy in this building already, and it was something that we wanted to continue. You know, Chinatown is such a special neighborhood to the community here, um, and also I think even America at large, what it represents as an immigrant community that has been, you know, had to persevere through a lot. Some of the success that I think Chinese Americans and Asian Americans have experienced is really was experienced here first in, in our Chinatown in San Francisco. So I just feel really proud of still trying to represent Chinese American food here um, and having people understand our, our culture and, and also just really take in so much from, from this really culturally rich neighborhood.
excited to have you guys be able to come back here, but we won't be having anyone indoors until we get a little bit more of our team vaccinated. And until then, we have outdoor dining, we have reservations on Resi, and we also um, are doing takeout on Talk. So please keep continuing to support us and any of the amazing restaurants here in Chinatown. Down here um, at Eastern Bakery, he sells a coffee crunch cake that is really um, iconic. Hi, this is Garrett at Mr. Jews. This is our house cocktail, the Pixie and Luna, named after our two beautiful goldfish. We'd love to have you come down to Chinatown and try one out. Hi, I'm Hisu Guan, and I'm showing two video pieces here, uh, Lei Musun Bridge and Miyang Lei Musun Kim. I came to the U.S. in 2017 for, to start the MFA at UC Berkeley. And in my first semester, like at the end of my first semester, I started some, I wrote some genesis about my, like, my version, because uh, I have some really specific um, family history. And my grandma and great-grandma was really sincere Catholic. They really, uh, they forced me and my sister to read the Bible every day and like talking about the Jesus and everything, but didn't let me to question about anything. Around the time when I was uh, in Berkeley, like I got some chance to write about something, whatever. There was no topic, but I could just develop some creative writing about my practice. So I wrote some Genesis, like criticizing, like parodying the. Catholic Genesis, and it was third. It was the third point of the lay Muslim. I conceptualized lay Muslim as autobiographical feminist religion. So, and I think my life, like previous life, was full of rituals to serve patriarchy, and patriarchy was my um, my religion since I was young. So. Like being being lay Muslim or joining lay Muslim means like converting my daily life to feminism. I think my mom's character is really important for me. Like other female ancestors are also important, definitely, and myself too. But I feel like my mom give and my mom's character gives me really like. Uh, strong inspiration to continue the Lay Muslim project and it's like some kind of driving force for me to do it because as I talked before she had cancer and luckily like she had some treatment without surgery and she got better but like I know she went through so many things and as a young Korean woman like she got married and like had two kids and like she went through all the like really strict patriarchal family rituals and the, the Catholic rituals too. Thank you all so much for joining us for this groundbreaking collaborative event. As part of our SF Pride 365 initiative to broaden our programming beyond June, we're looking forward to offering more expansive programming like Chinatown Pride in 2021 and beyond. To stay up to date on everything San Francisco Pride, make sure to follow us on social media and sign up for our newsletter at sfpride.org. Have a great rest of your night and we hope to see you soon. Happy early Pride.